July 2nd, 1937. 7,000 miles of empty ocean stand between Amelia Earhart and her bold attempt to be the first to fly around the world following the equator. She and her navigator Fred Noonan take off from Leigh, New Guinea for Howland Island, a speck of sand in the middle of the Pacific. It was the last anyone would see of her. Amelia Earhart. She belonged to the lonesome greats of the late 20s and 30s who dominated flying before the days of jets and rocket power. It's a mystery that's puzzled the world for decades. What happened to Amelia Earhart? The famous aviator and her navigator, Fred Noonan, disappeared without a trace in a remote part of the South Pacific on July 2nd, 1937. Earhart and Noonan took off from New Guinea on the second to last part of their trip around the world. Earhart was hoping to become the first woman to circle the globe. A last letter to her husband briefly summed up Amelia Earhart's philosophy of flying. She wrote, please know that I am aware of the hazards. I want to do it. Women must try to do these things as men have tried. When they fail, their failure must be a challenge to others. Earhart and Noonan mostly followed the equator as they flew around the world. The pair were aiming to land on an island in the South Pacific, but they were never seen or heard from again. On July 3rd, after taking off from New Guinea, headed for Howland Island, she and Noonan disappeared. The last radio report from the flying laboratory had announced that they were out of gas and were going to have to ditch. Tiny Howland Island had been missed. The United States immediately organized a huge search. The battleship Colorado and the carrier Lexington were pressed into duty to aid the Coast Guard cutter Itasca, who had been stationed in the area to assist with the flight. Some 200,000 square miles of ocean and nearby islands were to be searched, but to no avail. As the frantic and fruitless search for Amelia continues, the world may not have heard the last from her. Within hours of her disappearance, distress calls are reported by professional radio operators and later by amateurs with short wave sets around the Pacific and across the United States. Eventually, more than 100 reports come in, and the Navy and news media take them seriously, looking for clues. If Amelia is using her radio, she must be on land. To charge her batteries, she has to run the Electra's right engine, and it can't run unless the propeller is above water. On the night of July 3rd, calls apparently from Amelia are picked up by Pan Am Airways direction finding stations at Midway, Oahu, and Wake Island. When they track the signals to their source, it's in the Phoenix Islands, which includes Gardner, now called Nicomaroro. Some of the messages could help pin down Amelia's whereabouts. In Rock Springs, Wyoming, 16-year-old Dana Randolph claims to have picked up a call from Amelia, who says she is on a reef south of the equator. A woman in eastern Canada says she hears Amelia saying that the navigator is badly injured. Perhaps the most intriguing report comes from St. Petersburg, Florida. Betty Clank was a teenager in 1937. She often spent the afternoon listening to her family's shortwave radio, which was hooked up to a powerful antenna. And she kept a notebook handy to jot down the titles and lyrics of songs she liked. One July afternoon, while searching the dial, she hears a familiar voice. The first thing I heard was, this is Amelia Earhart. And that startled me. She said it several times. And I recognized that voice when I heard it. Betty shared her notebook and her memories of that day with Rick Gillespie in an interview for the Tiger Archives. She recalled that she listened for two hours as the signal faded in and out, and she took notes on what she heard. She was hurting, you know, there was something terribly wrong. It was a voice of desperation of a woman in grave danger. Betty heard a man's voice too. She believes he was injured and there were sounds of a struggle. You could hear him, but you couldn't make out what he was saying. But you could tell that she was trying to keep him away from the radio. And they'd wrestle around when he would try to get on. 
It reads like a modern transcript of a 911 call. There's confusion. There's things going on in the background. Betty remembers thinking she heard Amelia say New York City, and she wrote that down. And then she writes, or something that sounds like New York. New York City, New York City, Norwich City, Norwich City. Where we think the plane landed on the reef is right near the shipwreck, the Norwich City. And so you think of Earhart and Noonan on this island, they, if they don't know the name of the island, and they want to communicate the one thing about this island that is unique in the piece of information they can give, there's a shipwreck there. And the name of the ship is the Norwich City. Betty's notes about rising water would make sense if the plane were parked on the reef, subjected to shifting tides. At the time she was listening, it was nearly noon on the island. The interior of the metal plane would have been broiling hot, which could explain the injured man's desperation to get out. He was so uncomfortable and so miserable that they would just talk. And then he would kind of get out of his head again. The transcriptions in her notebook give us almost too intimate a picture of what was going on on that reef. These people were in horrible trouble. Some have questioned how Amelia's signals could have traveled thousands of miles to be picked up by a few random listeners in North America. But it is possible. The kind of radio that Amelia had on her plane often created extra signals called harmonics at multiples of the original frequency. Those harmonics can bounce off the ionosphere and travel vast distances. Radio expert Bob Brandenburg believes that Amelia's normal daytime frequency of 6,210 kilohertz would generate harmonics that could reach Betty's receiver. Those very high frequencies propagate very well. And so the way Betty described the signal, fading in and out, is exactly consistent with the way that signal would behave at that frequency being transmitted from Gardner Island. Finally, the signal faded out completely. The voices were gone. Betty may be the last person ever to have heard Amelia Earhart alive. And if she really did, chances are good that Amelia was calling from Nika Mororo. Stop what you're doing. Debris from a plane crash has been found off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And experts are saying that the debris could be from Amelia Earhart's plane. Back in the 1930s, a boy who lived on an island in Papua New Guinea saw a plane crash onto the beach. The plane's left wing was on fire. The boy rushed to tell his elders, but they didn't believe him. The tide then pulled the plane offshore into the water where it remains. The wreckage is now covered in coral after almost 100 years. William Snavely is the director of Project Blue Angel, the group that is currently trying to identify the plane. So in 2005, William Snavely went to Rabuel, Papua New Guinea to try to talk to locals who might know something about the plane crash. When he checked into his hotel, Snavely spoke to a corrections officer who knew about a plane crash that was seen by a little boy. A team from Project Blue Angel don't want to get too excited about the plane belonging to Amelia. But according to Snavely, everything they're seeing so far would tend to make them think it could be. The plane in the wreckage had a twin engine a twin tail, a door on the pilot's side, a loop at the front for navigation, and a spar as the antenna. Now, a world-renowned explorer is determined to help find them. Bob Ballard has led more than 150 deep-sea expeditions. He helped find the wreckage of the Titanic in the Atlantic Ocean in 1985. Many of the details of the so-called unsinkable ship can still be seen, preserved deep underwater. Now, Ballard is setting his sights on finding Amelia. The National Geographic Explorer at Large will film the expedition for a two-hour documentary. There are many theories about what could have happened to Amelia, from a crash in the Pacific to her capture by the Japanese. In 2017, that theory got a boost from a photo discovered in the National Archives that many thought showed her being taken prisoner by the Japanese. The photo was explored in a History Channel documentary, Amelia Earhart, The Lost Evidence. Experts say the figure in the photo has many similarities with Earhart. 
So we're looking at the distance from the top of her head to her underarms, and then from her underarms to her waist, right. and we can say that looking at this, they all line up. The photo even had a figure some thought looked like navigator Fred Noonan. But it turns out that the photo was taken two years before they disappeared, sending researchers back to the drawing board. Ballard and the National Geographic team plan to search deep underwater and on land for clues.